Well, I get the double privilege today of not only leading you in worship, but also bringing the teaching. Before I go any further, though, I want to thank my worship team, as well as the production teams who are making this happen. And I, I, I think you all noticed this amazing set. I'm loving the creative work that's being done by our team. Uh, the set, particularly Dan and Joanne, have pulled together. And I'm just so thankful for all the insight, all the work that's, that's being done. I'm excited to dive back into the letter of 1 John with you, into a series that we're calling Generation Jesus. If you're new with us this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. As a church, we've been working through the main content of a little letter that's found right near the back of the Bible, written by one of Jesus' closest followers. His name was John. In November, we started this series in 1 John with a series called living true. And then in January, February, we tackled the middle chapters in a series that we called What Matters Most. All those previous services are available on our website, as well as just the audio versions. And you can also download the audio through our podcast on iTunes. So if you want to catch up, you can do it that way. Well, in these last two chapters of 1 John, I'm very keen to dive into some of the defining characteristics of people who follow Jesus, of generation Jesus. And as we do, I want to invite you to come along with me, to take up this little letter of 1 John and dig into it for yourself, to read it, study it, go over it again and again, to pray about it and think about it and even talk to a friend about it. As some of you know, I've been uh, posting these little videos, just started a few weeks ago, called Spirit Sparks. They're available on Instagram as well as Facebook, and they're designed to help spark our spiritual walk by giving some different creative ideas for your scripture reading, for your spiritual walk, and some of those things might even be helpful as you consider engaging this letter of First John. Well, let me just pray for us as we begin. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would now speak to each one of us, whoever is receiving this at home or even watching later online. Lord Jesus, would you lead us and guide us today into all truth? In your name we pray. Amen. Well, from start to finish, John has provided clear teaching about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. Now, he offers his generation of Jesus' followers a concrete test for truth. John wants them to be spiritually discerning, able to dice and slice what is true from what is false. The first verse of chapter 4, 1 John, makes this clear, that the generation of Jesus is discerning. Listen to these first words. Dear friends, John writes, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many prophets, I'm sorry, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Notice this. John calls his congregation, his church, into active discernment. Not gullible about what they see and hear, but testing, weighing, engaging the truth claims that are being made by those around them. In the church that John is pastoring, the upfront concern has been these roving false prophets who are denying that Jesus is the Son of God come in the flesh. We've already seen them show up in this letter, and we're going to see more of them in a moment. But hear what John says. Generation Jesus is not to be a gullible generation. Generation Jesus is not to be swallowing whole the latest and greatest claims that are being made by this or that guru, this or that preacher, this or that celebrity, this or that politician. Neither what they're saying about Jesus or, frankly, what they're saying about how we should even live in the world. Rather, they are to be wise discerning, holding things out, and examining them closely to see if what's being said measures up, to see if what they're hearing is true. 
the kind of rigorous examination that John is encouraging here reminds me of how art experts work to identify forgeries. Intimate knowledge of the artist is, of course, of first importance, but so also is understanding how foragers try and fake what's real. I stumbled across this terrific video of how two art experts determine the authenticity of a Jackson Pollock painting. Let's watch this. This is Tiago Pivovarczyk and Jeff Taylor of New York Art Forensics. And this is a Jackson Pollock. Or at least it looks like one. But it's actually a fake. Here's how they figured it out. Today we will perform all the steps necessary to determine its authorship. Jackson Pollock was an American painter that painted from the early 20s to the 1950s. He's best known by the drift or core paintings that he did from 1947 to the time of his death in 1956. Pollock's drip paintings are considered his best period, so a uh, good-sized, well-preserved Jackson Pollock, he can go for over a hundred million dollars. There's a lot of claims of Jackson Pollock drip paintings, and our laboratory was able to identify over a hundred fakes. So we can say that we found more fakes than there are authentic Jackson Pollocks out there. We received this painting by a client that chose to remain anonymous. We're going to call him Sidney. A Jackson Pollock, the technique per se, that is not much of a mystery. So it is our opinion that this would not qualify as a Jackson Pollock painting. As I say, if the deal is too good, there's something wrong. Well, the rest of the video is fascinating, and these two experts work through a series of tests to determine their ultimate conclusion that this is a fake. I'll get the hosts to post the link of that in the chat if you want to follow up later and watch it. It's, it's really interesting. Friends, like forgery experts, we must be a generation of Jesus followers who are more acutely discerning of what we see, what we hear, and what we do. We are in an era of gullibility, where people are tossed to and fro by political ideology, by fear-mongering, by religious hypocrisy. Unfortunately, this is even happening among the church. But this is not the way it's supposed to be. So let's listen to John here. Don't believe every spirit. But let's get testy to see whether these spirits are from God. How? Well, John then goes straight to the core of everything. Yes, to the core of his main concern in his day, but actually to the core of our challenge today as well. They're actually the same. John goes straight to Jesus, who is the very center from which all truth flows. The measure against which all claims are measured. Because Generation Jesus is not to just be discerning, we are to be spiritually discerning, which means we are first and foremost super clear on Jesus Christ. Listen to this in verses 2 and 3. He says, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. This is how. John's going to offer a kind of proof test right now. Almost a, kind of like a, his equivalent of a forgery test, which we can use as the basis of our examination. This is how. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus 
is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Now, I've already told you how John is addressing a major error that's floating around, not only in his congregation, but in the larger culture. This explicit denial that Jesus, the Messiah, the explicit denial that he had come in the flesh from God. And if you dance back through 1 John, we've seen this error already raised a number of times. It's John's dominant concern. There's been some traveling preachers, false prophets, he calls them, who are claiming to speak for God, and yet are denying that Jesus is the Messiah, denying that he's the revelation of God, denying that he's essential for salvation, forgiveness, denying that loving others as a result of what Jesus has done is even necessary. And so John lays things down in in the plainest terms he can. He says, if they point to Jesus the Messiah as coming from God, boom, they are from God. If they don't, they aren't. And it's not, John wants them to know, it's not as though they are just sort of off, you know, or yeah, they kind of have a different perspective. No. John is super clear. If they're saying that kind of nonsense, they're actually against Christ. They are anti-Christ, enemies of Jesus, living examples of a spiritual force of deceit and evil that is present in the world. John just, wow, he pulls it out. As John has has a habit of doing, he is very stark. He is very bold. There's no room for wiggling around when he says things. Jesus come in the flesh from God, score! No, you're out of here. He's really clear. Well, how does this translate for us today? You know, we have the glorious benefit of what is now 2,000 years of theological and historical reflection on who Jesus is and what he has done. Though much of that essential sort of theological work about the identity and work of Jesus um, was done actually just in the first few centuries following Jesus. Thank God for these brothers and sisters who did this hard work for us. And Christians, be they Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox, speak with one unified voice about Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God, fully human, fully divine, who came from the Father to defeat death, to forgive sin, to ensure resurrection, and enable true fellowship with God. Or as the first century put it in shorthand, Jesus is Lord. There's no real disagreement on that, actually. And yet, I'm continually surprised at how many followers of Jesus do seem a little fuzzy on the facts about Jesus. Sometimes who he is, but often what he's about. This fuzziness on the facts about Jesus makes some Christians easy prey for bad theology, for uh, new age or some kind of winsome philosophy, or frankly, for religious legalism. So let's not be fuzzy about the facts on Christ. There's no reason we should be. We have a ton. I mean, there's there's just so much good teaching, good information. And while I do mean basic Christian theology, I'm also referring to basic Christian living. We don't just treat this as a head thing. This is a whole life thing. As we've seen all through John's letter, knowing God, the true God, and loving others are bound up together. They can't be separated. Right belief about Jesus and righteous loving of others are one and the same thing. So much so that John can say, as he did back in chapter 3, verse 10, anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Boom. One of the areas where we have to constantly battle misinformation is that being a Christian is only about believing the right things about Jesus. Even reading today's verses, you know, every spirit that says Jesus from the Son of God, from God is 
of the Spirit, all that from God. Even, even those verses, if ripped out of context, could lead you to think, hey, just confess the right things about Jesus and it's all good. Not so fast. It's clear from the larger context that the kind of Jesus-focused faith that John's talking about is always translated into a Jesus-like love. Always. I say that to make sure that we're not missing the forest for the trees here. But how does this basic test that John provides here at the start of 1 John 4 help us be spiritually discerning now? This is how. All truth is first in Christ. All spiritual discernment flows from this wellspring. Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. All truth. So, yes, there is the basic, fundamental Christian affirmation of who Jesus is. Spiritual discernment starts there. And yeah, it's an important part, important point to make. What, what, what people or powers, what, what religions or philosophies, what Uncle John or Aunt Marge or Deepak Chopra or Eckhart Tolle or this person down the street or this church across the way, what they think about Jesus, what they affirm about his identity does mark a dividing line in the world. Always helpful to ask. Whenever you're hearing someone speak about faith, about life, about God, to just inquire, what do you think about Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ? And not just waiting for them to say, oh, I believe in Jesus, because anyone can say that. But what specifically do you believe about him? good man, moral teacher, reincarnation of some divine spirit, a demigod, a superhuman, what? And and I don't mean, hear me rightly, that we can't still glean good things from writers who don't even affirm who Jesus is or other people. I can, we can, but in order to discern what is true and what is false, we have to understand who Jesus is first and what they believe about Jesus. That will help us be more discerning. This is key. The task of the Christian is to work from the core truth conviction that all truth is in Jesus Christ. That, as Paul says over in Colossians, in Christ, in Him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through Him And for him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, whether we are Christian parents, or Christian artists, or Christian scientists, I don't mean the religion, but, you know, practicing scientists, whether we are Christians who build homes, or practice law, or foster children, the way that we think and how we live is founded upon this basic truth that all truth is in Christ, that in him all things hold together together. And so much of what it means to be spiritually discerning and follow Jesus is working out the implications of just that. How we think politically. How we engage in a conversation about race. How we are to respond to this global health pandemic. How we are to interact online. How we are to pray for one another. What we are to think about what's happening. We are to be shaped by who Jesus is and what he is doing in the world. The identity of Jesus Christ is the core foundation from which all spiritual discernment comes. In other words, Generation Jesus is spiritually discerning because Generation Jesus is all about Jesus. What does this mean? Let me be practical. First, this means that we know Jesus with the intimate knowledge of a starstruck fan. Do you know what I mean by that? I'm talking about the kind of sports fan or boy band fan or fantasy world fan or video game fan. You know, the kind of fan that has all the gear, who's watched all the shows, played all the games, never missed a match, sports the t-shirt until it's ragged, 
You know, they get birthday cakes with the figures on it. The, the kind of intimate knowledge that knows all the backstories, has read the authorized biographies and the unauthorized biographies, and they blog about it. You know, the kind of fan that co-hosts podcasts and, and maybe runs a Facebook fan page for other fellow nerds. If you've met a fan, you know what I mean. Well, here's the thing. Every follower of Jesus needs to be a thoroughgoing fan of Jesus. I don't mean that you need to wear weird hats or even host Facebook forums, but each of us need to be intimately aware, deeply knowledgeable, profoundly interested in the ins and the outs and the everything there is to know about Jesus. Friends, all spiritual discernment, which then plays out into all of life, starts right here with Jesus the Messiah. Do we know him? Yes, about him. But know him personally. Are we following him? Are we talking to him daily? Are we walking with him? Are we studying the scripture? Are we imagining gospel scenarios? Are we, are we teasing out the implications of who he is? What it means that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, that he rose again from the dead, that he is bringing a new heavens and a new earth. Can we speak with confidence about our friend Jesus as one of his biggest fans? Because it's only by knowing Christ that we will become truly wise. It is only by walking with Jesus that we will become spiritually discerning. It is by him that everything else makes sense. You know, C.S. Lewis famously said, after he had forsaken atheism and embraced Jesus Christ, said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. By it, I see everything else. By Jesus, I can come to understand. Because of Jesus, we can discern what is true. This is what it means for Jesus, the source of all truth, to help us make sense of the world, to become spiritually discerning not only about Jesus, but about the rest of our lives, too. Do you know what to do as a parent? You don't? Keep going back to Jesus. You don't know how to respond to this family member who won't forgive you? Keep coming back to Jesus. At a loss about how to react to the latest craziness that's happening at work or at school or on social media? Keep coming back to Jesus. Can't figure out how to serve, where to grow, what to do? You got it. Keep coming back to Jesus. The more we know Jesus, the more we discern truth. So, in order to be spiritually discerning, we must know Jesus with the intimate knowledge of a starstruck fan. But we can't stop there. John, John doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't stop there. Christians don't stop there. The second way spiritual discernment is all about Jesus is that we follow Jesus with an everyday sacrificial love for others. This point has already been pressed today and throughout our previous two series coming out of this letter. There is no true faith in Jesus where there is no practical love for others, period. Now, I want you to hear me right. We sin, of course. We fail. I mean, we are frail people. And there are times where we realize I have not loved. We falter. And friends, we walk in forgiveness, not in judgment, not in guilt. We have received grace upon grace for our frailty and our sin. But make no mistake about it. Christian living is both what we affirm about Jesus doctrinally. That's the fancy word for all the things we believe about him. We, we, we affirm uh, the things we affirm about Jesus doctrinally and what we reveal about Jesus practically. We can't pull them apart. And this is where what we believe about Jesus is actually worked out in life. You know, it's fairly easy 
to say and affirm that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came in the flesh, that he gave up his rights, that he laid down his freedom, that he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but became like a servant, one of us, taking upon himself our sin, our shame, entering into our suffering and death for us, and then rising again to give us new life and ensure the new creation that's coming. We can affirm all that wonderful truth. But it is when we enter into the brokenness of other people's lives, when we love others as Jesus has loved us, that we will begin to truly understand, to truly exp- express, to truly grasp both who Jesus really is and also how he is calling us to live in the world, where he is still at work in the world. Spiritual discernment is not just worked out in theory, it's worked out in practice. And it's done every day, sometimes every hour, as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus and love others in the flesh. People in our household, people in our community, people in our school, we love them as living witnesses to Jesus who has also come in the flesh. Well, I've got a treat for you today. Throughout this series, I'm reaching out to some of you to hear from you and talk to you and hear what you have to say related to some of these themes that are going to be emerging through 1 John 4 and 5. And this week, I spoke to Canny Mawson about spiritual discernment. I know you'll find her insights encouraging and helpful. If you haven't taken any notes yet today, pull out a piece of paper and start taking some notes now. Well, Kenny, thanks for joining me today in this little interview where we're going to talk about wisdom and discernment. Uh, we're, of course, exploring the book of 1 John again in this new series. And today, we're thinking about what it means to be spiritually discerning, what it means to grow in wisdom as a follower of Jesus. And so I just wanted to ask you a few questions, and you just respond in whatever way uh, you know fits and makes, makes sense to you. I wondered how following Jesus has helped you discern right and wrong in your life. Okay, well, um, for starters, it's, it's quite subtle. Like the things I need to decide every day are not big moral issues. I'm pretty clear on the what's right and wrong that way, as I think most, most people are. So really, it's the very, very subtle things that you need help with and oftentimes when you're going through life in a hurry and at a pace, you don't even think you're making decisions. You just think you're living your life. Right. Um, and if you're not cognitive of um, Jesus's plan for you and his words in your life, then, um, then you do get into situations that you, you shouldn't have got yourself into. But there you are because you haven't been making those decisions in that way. So I think the way that Jesus helps me, my relationship with Jesus helps me in all those little little decisions that I make every day of how to speak to people, how to, um, how to show Christ in my life. And um, I think I, it makes me slow down mm-hmm. and, and think, okay, am I a good reflection of my savior? Mm -hmm. Uh, When they see me, do they know they are loved, you know, um, and that kind of stuff. And when you're, I've certainly had incidences in my life, but only a handful where the Lord actually spoke to me Mm -hmm. um, in a crisis. And I was, uh, you know, guided that way, but that is not the norm of my life. My life is more making decisions and uh, that don't even seem like a decision, but, but Christ is guiding me all the time and make that phone call, write that card, uh, you know, go back into that room you were in and talk to that person that, you know, it's so subtle, Tom. And a lot of, a lot of what Jesus teaches us is um, they're kind of, opposite as well like you're supposed to be a warrior uh and peaceful you're supposed to be a lion and a lamb you're supposed you know they're they're so you you need to be following jesus so you know when are you going to be a lion when are you going to be a lamb when are you going to go in like a warrior when are you going to be in go in like a peacemaker you know when when are you going to 
be gentle and when are you going to be more forceful? And if you're not listening to Jesus, you can mess that up. But at the same token, if you mess that up, Jesus can fix it too. So it's not like the end of the world. It just, it's just uh, life is better. It reminds me that, um, you know, the need for us to be consciously every day dependent on the Holy Spirit. It's not like God gave us, even, you know, he gave us his word, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But it's not like we open the word and, and it tells us what to do in every single situation. It's not like that. Um, rather, we have to walk in step with the Spirit, exactly what you're talking about. But I'm wondering what role scripture study, Bible study in particular, has played in your life in helping you grow in wisdom, in grow in spiritual discernment. It is all there is. You have no way to grow or know anything about spiritual discernment without being in the Word. There, there. Um, they're not separatable. You can't have one without the other. Um, it's been my experience. And um, it doesn't matter how much or how little, like at times in my life uh, with five kids and a busy household and everything, it was, I was no scholar, but I did commit to opening the word of God. And I did commit to reading uh, and, you know, sometimes fell asleep while I was reading, <laughs> or, you know, constant interruptions or whatever, but he has been faithful to honor that time that I spent with him. And, and um, now I'm in this wonderful period of life where I have lots of time to devote to his word and he's just blessing me a hundredfold um, as I as I get to actually Bible study. I wouldn't say before that I was much on the study. Right. Now I'm uh, uh, now I get to actually say, oh, I can study this and look up stuff and you know have that kind of joy enjoyment uh, with Scripture. But I'm an absolute ardent person that you have to be in the Word because it is living. Hmm. And you might have learned something in Sunday school and you might learn something uh, in your past or whenever you did have an opportunity to look at scripture. Um, and I'm not negating that God can use all of that. But because you're living and the word is living, what you read today is going to be applicable to what you're going to do today. And he is going to give you a message that is going to be relevant for you today. Wow. Um, and that is exciting because yep. you have those moments of like, oh yeah, I just, I just read about this. Or it causes you to stop and think about something that, uh, or a way that you were going to approach a situation and it, and it changes it. It, uh, it changes it. It makes you stop and think about it. I love that. So you're actually making a very direct connection between spiritual discernment and the study of scripture, that they actually are hand in hand, can't have one without the other, which uh, is so significant, I think, for people to get a hold of, because sometimes we think, I don't know, spiritual discernment is some sort of ethereal floating thing that we just kind of go based on how we feel. And then we think of scripture study as this sort of, I don't know, dry words on a page, but it's not, neither of those things are true. It comes together at the living word of God, the living spirit of God. And, and um, not to negate how fabulous your sermons are huh. and your preaching you. is, uh -huh. uh, but it is not the same as oh. being in the living word. And I, um, people can't just go to church on Sunday, be fed by you. You use scripture and quote scripture. So theoretically it is, but it, because they're living a life, that you're not living and the Lord is living in the word. It, it doesn't speak to them as, as much as scripture does. And I agree. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that's come out through this period of COVID is the need for people to take initiative ownership actually of their life in Christ in a way that perhaps when they came to church and they heard, you know, we're kind of part of some of those regular things. I think, maybe we forgot or missed some of that. And I think this has really reminded us that if we don't take initiative, if we don't study the scripture, if we aren't seeking the Lord's face and discerning the spirit as we walk each day, 
oh, well, somebody else isn't going to do it for us. And no. so I think it's been a powerful reminder. And you're missing out. You're missing yeah. on this right. terrific relationship that's mm -hmm. uh, sweet and, and alive and exciting. You know? Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. What would you, just as we close today, what would be just your encouragement to us as the Erickson Covenant Church when we think about how to grow in spiritual discernment? I think my biggest uh, thing that I'm going to be on probably for the rest of my life is open your Bible. Huh. Open your Bible. Hear what the Lord has to say. Mm -hmm. Read the love letter that he has written you. It is our instruction book for life. Um, I, I just want everybody to have the same benefit that I have from, from doing that. And I am not an academic, I'm not a Bible scholar, but he meets me there every single day. And, and he, that I'm not unusual. He would do that with anybody. <laughs> so um, I, just, I just want people to open up their Bibles and get in a Bible study and talk to your friends about what you've read and start some conversations and let's talk about the Lord. That's great. Thank you, Kenny. Your words have been a great encouragement to us. Okay, Tom, thank you for having me. Wasn't that great? Thank you, Kenny, for sharing with us. It's great, powerful stuff. Well, what now? Well, I'd like to step into something personal. Something personal as well as something pastoral. I want to share with you in... Um, a real honest way, how Tanil and I have been spiritually discerning our response to the provincial health orders around COVID. Now, you might be wondering, why are you going to say that now? Let me give you a little backstory and then I'll dive into it. I realized over the last few weeks as I talked to some of you that I needed to kind of come out and tell you more clearly the ways that Tanil and I have discerned how we are to be responding to the pandemic that's going on, but in particular to the provincial health orders that we've been given. And the reason why I needed to share this was because I realized last week in conversation with some of you that I had never really gotten clear. I'd never really spoken about the decisions that we've made. And as a result, I think maybe you've been making some assumptions about what we've been doing. I realized last week that um, people were assuming that, for example, in our own private lives, uh, we had been breaking the protocol. That um, we were sort of, you know, maybe keeping up the right pretenses, but in actual fact, we'd been socializing with family and friends when the truth is we haven't been, certainly not outside of the provincial health orders. Now, at the very same time, I've been reading the scripture and praying for you as a congregation, and, and I've been challenged lately that, as a pastor, as a leader, um, I need to set an example for you. And I've been trying to do that actually in my life, but I realized through this time that uh, it's a little hard to set an example if you're not actually seeing it. And I haven't spoken about this clearly, and so I want to share that with you today. There are three things that are forming our, I'm going I'm to speak for Tanil and I, um, but our response to the provincial health orders during this whole pandemic. Three things I want to explain to you because they are core to how we are spiritually discerning our response. We believe that we need to keep the provincial health order. We believe that we need to continue to pray for and submit to our authorities and to do what we can in the midst of this crazy time to follow the rules that we've been given by the health professionals, and to love our neighbors in those concrete ways. Why? Why have we spiritually discerned that? First of all, we have done this because of the authority of Scripture. We've discerned that this is the proper, godly, and Christian response because Scripture is very clear to us in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, those two passages at least, that we are, as Christians, to submit to our governmental authorities. We are not always going to agree with what is done, but as far as we are able to do so, we are to submit. 
The authority of Scripture is pretty clear on that. Scripture is pretty clear, and because we believe we live under the authority of it, it's important that we do the best that we can to obey that. And so believing that we need to live and operate under what we have been told through Scripture, Tanil and I have discerned that the proper response during this pandemic has been, as far as we were able to do, to truly keep the provincial health orders. This means also that we are to regularly pray for our authorities, our governmental authorities, our health authorities. I try to pray daily for Dr. Bonnie Henry, for Adrian Dix, for the Premier, as well as Trudeau and Tam and others. I try to pray daily for our hospital administrators and staff and nurses and other healthcare professionals here in this valley because I believe this is what actually the Scripture commands me to do, commands us to do, and all the while submitting to that authority insofar as I am able. And up to this point, I do not believe that breaking these health orders has been warranted by Scripture. So, the authority of Scripture, we have discerned that it is right to keep these protocols. The second reason has been also very compelling to us, and that has to do with our witness to Jesus. Friends, the world, I want to say it that way, People outside the church, but in particular, young people, they are watching the response of, okay, I'm going to say it, older Christians, uh, people in the church. They've been seeing it through social media. They've been seeing it in person. Where people who have claimed to follow Christ and live under the authority of Scripture have just disregarded or rejected these protocols. And it is doing damage to our witness to Christ. For Tanil and I, this has been very personal because we have felt that we've needed to live out these protocols right before the watching world of two young men. They happen to live in our house. To demonstrate to them that we don't pick and choose what parts of the Bible we're going to try to obey when it's most comfortable or most easy for us, but rather living under the authority of Scripture and following Jesus actually means something, even in those times or maybe especially in those times when it's really difficult to do so. And that witness to Jesus has been critical in our household, but also critical in the larger society. Friends of mine who are unchurched, friends of mine who are quite anti-religious, they have shared with me how difficult it has been for them to see Christians demanding their rights or pushing, shoving, or speaking with such disregard about this. They've had a tough time seeing Jesus in that. It's actually been harmful to our witness. That has caused Tanil and I to spiritually discern that to keep the health protocols is an important part of how we point others to Christ, how we live as an example. I know that that um, has been difficult for some of you to recognize, but I want to say that that has been a huge deal for us. And then the third reason why we have spiritually discerned that we need to keep the protocols personally is actually because Jesus calls us to sacrificially love others, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Throughout this crisis, part of the call of the government, the health authorities, has been to act in such a way that we protect those who are most vulnerable about us. And friends, I cannot think of a more gospel-centered thing to do. As Jesus followers, we follow a man, we follow a God who came and gave up his freedom and rights, laying down his life for us so that we could be saved, so that we could live. And he calls us to do the same for others. And so keeping the protocols is a critical way that we are able to join hands in supporting, well, maybe not literally join hands, you know what I'm saying, join hands metaphorically with our health authorities, with our governmental leaders in combating this virus that will take out the most vulnerable among us, or at least threaten them. We have felt that this is the very gospel-centered and Christian thing to do. We have never done this out of fear. Rather, we've done it out of love. We've never done it out of weakness or a lack of a spine, but rather because we believe this is witness. Nor have we done this because we blindly trust the government, but rather biblical submission commands us to do that as far as we are able. Now, as your pastor, I open this up today to actually challenge you, to actually say to you, look, as your pastor... I am doing my best, we are doing our best, to have integrity so that we live out before the watching world our submission to Christ under the authority of Scripture, 
showing how the gospel affects even the fact that we wear a mask or socially distance or follow these protocols. And I do urge you as your pastor to do the same. Now, I understand there's been plenty of pushback or there's been um, fatigue or there's challenges around this. But all three of these things that I've mentioned make a powerful case. Any one of them would be a reason to do so. But they make a very powerful case that we can't just glibly disregard or willfully ignore. One of the difficult things for us, uh, Tanil and I, has been recognizing that there are many among us who sort of keep the protocol, but then privately or on their own are just breaking it, not living in submission to Scripture, and not, in fact, being good witnesses to Christ, putting at risk those who are most vulnerable. And friends, I want to simply challenge you. We are called to be spiritually discerning, so let's do it. You, today, take up these three things. If you are a follower of Jesus, take up these things. This challenge about the authority of Scripture in Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. Uh, Our need to be witnesses to Christ in how we live, particularly before the watching world and particularly our young adults, as well as the call to sacrificially love others. Take those up and work them through. Now, you may come to a different conclusion than we have, but make sure you've done that by spiritually discerning through these things according to the Scripture, not just because it's uncomfortable, not just because you politically don't like it, but because as a follower of Jesus, you were submitted to him and you've spiritually discerned the steps that you need to take. Well, I share that with you in humility, but also with a challenge. I want to leave the closing words today to John himself. The last few verses of our passage today say this, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. He's talking about the people that say all this nasty stuff, untrue stuff about Jesus. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. What John does here at the end is very simple. He says, who we are bears out. Our identity matters. And as followers of Jesus, as the generation Jesus, we are called to be spiritually discerning, centered on the person of Jesus Christ, who we love (laughs) as one of his biggest fans, but also who we follow as our greatest Lord, out into the world, revealing who he is through what we say and through what we do. We want to lead you in this next song, which is really all about our identity, remembering that it is who God says that we are that shapes who we are and how we respond.